Hi, my name is Danny, and I'm here to give a presentation on aluminum repair for the collision repair segment uh, featuring the DentFix AluSpot DF900 and the setup for those types of tools and equipment, ensuring the best success. Uh, today's presentation is something I went through for some of our reps as well as some shops and uh, went ahead and recorded our presentation for your viewing. I hope you enjoy it. Feel free to leave any comments below. I'll be checking those and answering any questions. You can also get in touch with us at ppxreps.com. Enjoy the presentation. Okay, yeah, adding heat to it is gonna definitely help with the aluminum repair. Correct. And, and yeah. how do you do that heat, Mark? With a heat gun or, or what? Um, I was doing a heat gun, but we also have one of those, uh, uh, it's like an infrared, those uh, for drying, drying paint. It's just an infrared. Okay. Big lights type of thing? Yeah, lights. Yeah, in infrared. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. We're going to definitely talk about heating aluminum and everything as we get this kicked off. Uh, I've hit the record button, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we're going to go through a presentation on aluminum repair, everything I know about aluminum, and the DentFix AluSpot DF900 uh, series. I look forward to... Um, getting an aluminum discussion kicked off here with Team Aluminum. And so uh, I, I'm not at the shop today where I have the tools and equipment and stuff in front of me, but hopefully we can still get uh, through a lot of this information and help everybody out with uh, the information that we've put together. So I'm gonna get started with the presentation. Jump in with any sort of questions that you have. Uh, you can type them in the chat box if you want to keep me moving, and I'll just go ahead and uh, check that every now and then. Uh, let's keep ourselves on mute if uh, we're not talking, and let's get into a screen share here. All right, I want to keep this quick. I want to keep it to about 45 minutes to an hour with some Q&A. Uh, I will kind of go through some of this stuff pretty quick. Uh, slow me down if I need to explain something a little bit more. Uh, as we record this video, we hope to put it online to help anybody out in the future. So today's uh, July 17th, 2020. Um, just kind of wanted to go through some of the steps of why. Why are we using aluminum on vehicles today? Definitely because manufacturers are switching to more light, lightweight materials. It's to improve fuel efficiencies. Uh, the costs of the metal as well are much more effective when you're talking about mass production. We'll get into that. A prediction has it that by 2025, more than 75% of all new pickup trucks produced in North America will be aluminum bodied. Uh, aluminum and automobiles will save 44 million tons of carbon dioxide emission and uh, 108 million barrels of crude oil energy. A lot of that is due to fuel efficiencies and meeting these CAFE standards. So you as a repairer need to be more apt on how to deal with aluminum and why you would be wanting to repair aluminum in your shop. Let's talk about AL, number 13 on the periodic table of elements. Uh, aluminum is the third most available element in the Earth's crust. First and second would be oxygen and silicone, but it is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. Aluminum has an atomic number of 13. It's placed on the far right of the periodic table of elements. It does show some hints of non-metal behavior. Paramagnetic which means it's got very little, very weak magnetism. Aluminum is the world's most used metal, excluding iron. And it's actually refined from a bauxite ore, uh, which is commonly found mostly in Australia. Raw aluminum, and it's an aluminum state, has to be uh, refined from this bauxite ore. But for commercial use and for manufacturing, it's actually worked in with an alloy to make it much more stronger and more workable. Uh, those alloys could be anything like manganese, silicone, magnesium, copper, tin, or zinc. Uh, and I went ahead and highlighted silicon and magnesium because these are the two most common elements that are alloyed with aluminum for the type of aluminum that we're gonna be talking about today. So we'll get more into that as we get going, um, but uh, the US, imports about a third of their aluminum from Canada. And as far as why we're using aluminum as well, is it's, it's very efficient to be used. It, it really, it only requires 5% of the energy 
uh, compared to the production of steel. And it requires only 5% of the electric energy to recycle uh, compared to that of steel as well. Recyclability and abundancy. Vehicle production today, everybody knows about the 2015 Ford F-150. Uh, that's a, a vehicle that had really put aluminum panels into the mainstream conversation. Uh, we know Ford's been a best-selling vehicle since 1982 uh, with their F-Series. 780,000 units is what it looks like on these vehicles. So these are trucks that are coming into the shop today. Uh, aluminum doors, aluminum hood, side panels, bedside tailgates, plus a whole lot of interior structural components. Ford estimates that 20,000 of these trucks are going to be needing body repair every month. Moving forward, it's important to know that a lot of these vehicles are going to be more and more percentage based of aluminum. It's also important to know that there are all aluminum vehicles and aluminum intensive. Uh, certain times it's a hood where maybe the fenders continue to be steel. Uh, sometimes it's a back lift gate, but what they are are individual panels sometimes throughout the vehicle that are lightening up the vehicle in, in both structural and non-structural type components. Uh, this is actually from 2005, a list that I found. Uh, these are vehicles with like full aluminum bodies. These are some pretty sporty vehicles. You got Jaguars, the Aston Martin, Vanquish, BMWs, Audis, Ferraris. Those didn't make it into Main Street Collision. Uh, I think that a lot of times uh, those were taken to very specialty repair centers that are very aligned with the training and the tools and the resources to complete those repairs. Um, the list was actually so long, I didn't have a ch enough time to put it onto that previous slide. That list didn't even include the Ford F-150. It didn't even include the Teslas. And especially when we talk about the future of aluminum, there's even more to be added to that list. So 67% of all new light vehicles sold are light trucks and SUVs. 270 million of these light vehicles are in operation in the U.S quite a bit of these passenger trucks. So my point is, is that the aluminum wave is building momentum and this is definitely a good team to be on. Dodge had a loss of 225 pounds when they just switched out the hood and doors. Uh, GM had a loss of 240 pounds with uh, adding the tailgate as well. 732 pounds with that Ford F-150 when they introduced it from the previous models. So that's obviously gonna give them much more fuel efficiency, which is the basis of the conversation. In the future, these automobile manufacturers are being forced to be more fuel efficient, and therefore, I believe aluminum to be a bright future ahead. That's the history and some information about uh, aluminum. Any questions on that before I move forward? Um, am I correct that all the Toyota Camrys are going to be all aluminum? Is that the model that's coming out? I, I'm not sure as much on the vehicle specific stuff. As I get more hands on, I think we'll have a better resource to uh, catalog which vehicles. But the Toyota Prius, I've got a Toyota Prius hood that I've been using for some pulls. So I know that, yeah. um, I'm, I know you're getting a lot more mainstream vehicles uh, coming into the, uh, the fold with aluminum. Just curious, thank you. All right, I'm on a roll. Uh, uh, great segue too, because you know, before, you know, you, you had like two classes of shops, I, I felt, you know, you had your really high end A shops that were the certified shops. And, and if you drove a Jag, um, you were likely to take that Jag after a collision into a Jaguar certified shop that had invested in the tools, the training, the resources, and a database of information on how to fix that particular vehicle. So, so as we move forward, I do want to make a distinction between the certified shops that like Jaguar, Audi, uh, Audi, Land Rover type stuff versus, you know, Main Street Collision or First Street Collision, you know, that distinction between the everyday shop and some more higher end sophisticated. Um, I believe our opportunity with this presentation is aimed more towards the First Street Collision type shops. And why that is, is because as this wave builds into those Toyota Prius, 
into some of the other vehicles, there tends to be a lack of information if you're not part of the certified network. You know, they, they paid into that network. They, they really had invested with their technicians to fly abroad and to learn this in, in a classroom type setting. So there is a big lack of information out there and uh, the resources can be vague, confusing. So, and a lot of times the vehicle manufacturer procedures aren't perfect. Other thing to notice that all panels are not equal. You know, if you have a, a certain thickness or a certain, certain density or certain temperature uh, that you were able to make your pulls, that might not be the same panel to panel. So not all panels being equal there. Additional resources where you might be able to find vehicle specific information would be from that vehicle manufacturer's website, um, publications from the, the OE. So let's say it's Toyota. Um, all data for some more OEM information. Uh, the OEMOneStop.com should have vehicle specific. ICAR classes and website is a huge bank of information as well. And then there are different training providers like your CCC, your Mitchell type programs uh, that should be loaded with more current data on vehicle specific. Why would a shop want to repair aluminum when that car rolls into their shop versus, versus replace aluminum is, is a big difference within shops. A lot of times they take that job because they know they can just replace the door, knock, knock off a few nuts and bolts, hang a new door on there, paint it, send it along. Um, but if it was a vehicle that required an actual repair, this gives you the ability to start that repair quickly. You don't have to wait for that door to come in. What's nice is you can get started on that right away. That's gonna reduce all your rental fee costs. It's gonna reduce your hard cost on the new door. There's no parts to purchase, which can often be uh, costly. So we've got a lot of really unique features about our equipment as well uh, with the dent fix that really will allow you to be the most successful at repairing it, minimizing the damage, working within the damaged area, less painting, blending, uh, it might even save you a additional panel to paint because if you've got a damage right in the middle of the panel and you're going to strip out all of your paint down to the bare metal aluminum to pull to do your repair a lot of other machines out there require a ground point of contact with the panel to be placed maybe with a clamp on the edge of the panel and if you're going to use the edge of the panel that's going to blend into the next panel adjacent you might have to work your blend out there and actually do an additional paint area there. So we'll get into the features of that AluSpot 900 pretty soon. So I'm going to go through each of these five, five important factors of aluminum here one by one, because I think that they're pretty important to know. But just as a brief overview, aluminum is a soft metal. It is much softer than the steel panels technicians are used to working with. It's not more difficult, it's just different. So it's gonna need a little bit more finesse. It's gonna need a little more delicacy. You're gonna need to be more gentle with it. It's gonna take longer. So um, we talked about how it's a soft metal. It's, it's actually too soft in its own original state. So that's why they alloy it with, with either the magnesium or the silicone, which pretty much gives us two categories of aluminum. Uh, that we're mostly going to be talking about here forward. That's going to be the aluminum magnesium and the aluminum silicone. It's a work hardened material, so it, it has a, a hardened memory. Um, this makes it want to stay in its current shape. So once it's formed, either as a door panel or as a door panel after an accident, that damage has work hardened it into that new form, that new shape. You know, you're going to have to work each area back into form and create that new form each time. So when you dent it like that, it actually makes it stronger because it's a work hardened material, which will then require you to work it back into form. A lot of times you're going to want to apply heat and, and heat needs to be required, especially to larger dents uh, at the correct temperature. Um, we're going to talk more about that because that's an important topic. Aluminum will start to oxidize within like 15 minutes. The, the oxidation will need to be removed. 
and there's a few different techniques on removing the oxidation. This is going to ensure a really strong weld. And we're going to mention how it's, uh, it does corrode in the presence of steel uh, and an electrolyte, such as water, such as just moisture in the air. Again, I'm going to review these. It's a soft metal. It's easy to stretch. It's, it's difficult to shrink. It's a blended metal. So it's either aluminum magnesium or aluminum silicone. And we got two different studs to be able to stick and give you proper attach points for your pulls with either the DF900PM, which is the alumagnesium spots, or the DF900PS, which is the silicone spots. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about where you would use those. Most vehicles, and I'll use the term most vehicles, the most common, the most manufactured vehicles, use the magnesium. So think your M's. This is just a rule of thumb. Your Fords, your GM's, your Tesla, uh, your Hondas, I'm sorry. They're most likely to be a magnesium, okay? But when you get those sporty vehicles, the Audis, the Jaguars, the less maybe seldom manufactured vehicles because they're not high production, other exotics, those would use the silicone studs. Now that's just a general rule of thumb. Always refer to your tech manual from the OE to determine what the power setting is as well as what studs are, are proper for that panel. But as a nice rule of thumb, one way to know is to use the M or the S or trial and error. What you're gonna find is that if you use the wrong stud, it's gonna kind of pop, it's gonna burn, you're gonna go to pull it and it's gonna pull right off. You're not gonna have that strong connection. So if you've got both bags sitting there, the alu magnesium and the alu silicon, you don't know, pop one or two of them on, give it a pull, you will, you'll know pretty quickly. So that's why it's important too, when you get your alu, your alu spot unit, you get two bags. That's the difference between those two bags of pins. There should be 400 pins in the bag. Don't just dump them all in one container. They look the same. You really can't tell the difference between them. So keep them in their bags, keep them away from contamination, they're ziplocked. pull out the bag for the type that you need, and then just be able to use them. Aluminum being work hardened, and, and like I said, when it's stamped into shape, a certain shape, that's where it becomes strong. And if you flex it too much beyond that shape, it's gonna crack and bend like a spoon, which is gonna create damage that's not fixable. It does not have a memory, so therefore you've gotta be able to work it back into its existing shape, which requires some finesse. The heat requirements for aluminum, I'm not here to give specific temperature ratings. I'm actually gonna stay away from that for a minute. I know you don't wanna get it anywhere near 600 degrees because that's where aluminum tends to anneal and that's where you're gonna to start to have damage. Aluminum will melt at a very low temperature. 1200 degrees is a melting temperature for aluminum. If you get anywhere near that, you're gonna burn a hole in the panel and it's, it, you're gonna be replacing the panel very quickly. So it's really important that you don't use a torch to heat the gun. Uh, a torch gun to heat the panel. Uh, using a heat gun that comes with our DX and DXE units is recommended, but it's also important to know where you're at with your temperature. So we also provide a digital thermometer that allows you to uh, shoot the laser onto your area and get a very accurate reading. The studs will get hot when you heat up the panel. Let's say you're at 275 or 300 in that range, that's a hot stud. So just Keep that in mind when, you know, when you're playing around with it with your fingers. Um, but that heat should dissipate fairly quickly out of aluminum. It'll heat up quickly as well. So just be careful because you can go from 400 to 600 really easily. Okay, so I'm not giving any specific uh, temperatures as far as where you should be. I think that changes from panel to panel. It could change between alu silicon and alu magnesium, but document your information. Once you start to feel it and feel it pop and you know what temperature you're at, write down the make model temperature, you know, of the vehicle. That way, if you ever come across it again, you've got a nice little notebook of, of information. Okay. Again, the aluminum will oxidize in as little as 15 minutes. We provide these uh, shoehorn and toothbrush uh, style stainless steel brushes. Oxidation, you're going to use those you know, stainless steel wire brushes, and you're going to vigorously sand away your oxidation after the paint's been removed. This is really important. If you're not getting clean welds uh, because that panel sat out for a few minutes, it's 
probably because there's too much oxidation. So I, I got a little video on that I can share as well. But it's important to remove all this oxidation. Um, you're not going to burn it off uh, when you do your heating because oxide will melt at a much higher temperature than uh, the actual aluminum will. So if that stud pin's not on there correctly and there's too much oxidation between it, when you go to remove that pin later, you have the ability to damage the panel underneath. I use this tree as an example. If you have an aluminum pin that you stuck into your aluminum panel and it got roots, I mean, it really dug down into that aluminum either because the power setting was too high or because you didn't get a clean weld because the aluminum corroded or it, it had too much oxidation and you go to remove that pin, guess what's going to come with it? All the roots. You're going to pop a hole in that aluminum panel and create damage uh, that's going to be seen later down the line. So making sure to remove the oxidation, the point I want to make here is this is just an early preparation for the correct removal of the pins later. You would hate to be able to do a very successful repair and then at the very end, pulling your pins off, create more damage uh, because you didn't do this oxidation step properly. So we talked about corrosion and contamination. You know, aluminum will start to corrode in the presence of a, uh, of a, of a, of a more noble metal and a uh, electrode like water, you know, something mo moisture. And so um, what happens is, is that corrosion will really want to attack the less noble metal like aluminum. That's why we don't want to integrate our steel tools from our aluminum tools. It's really important to keep them separate. So again, just back to that initial thing, it's a soft, work-hardened, heat-required oxidation corrosion. Hopefully that makes sense on a couple of the key factors that you want to know to ensure successful repairs. And now on to the fun stuff. The DF900 is a wonderful tool. It operates off of uh, 110 volts of electricity. There are multiple power settings. Comes with a five-year warranty. Has a wonderful design. The grounds for the tool or integrated into the gun, which is really important. We'll show some videos of that here in a second. No trigger, which is nice. Just go ahead and push down and then you're gonna get your pop weld and you'll pull and, and leave your stud behind. Why is there no trigger? Because a lot of times uh, when you go to pull the trigger up, it creates a bit of an upward motion with your arm. And you don't want to have that. You want to be able to push your pressure down into the panel to ensure that you really get a strong weld. So therefore, it's not a trigger operated. It's, it's a push down and it's built right into the gun. Once you have everything loaded and it's got a good uh, ground points, pops it right on. Simply the best. Other job specific tools as it relates to aluminum and all the tools and equipment that goes along with it. We talked about having a digital temperature heat gun. Being able to have that infrared temperature gauge in your other hand to accurately tell where you're at is important. Abrasive grinding discs and our inline undercoat removal tool, the DX700. The 700DX is a, is a great paint stripping removal tool. Stainless steel brushes both those magnesium and silicone stud pins with finger pullers or the eyelets. Uh, you get the T handle, the bridge puller, the leverage puller, and a squeeze puller. The hammers and dollies. And then we even have a little segment on, on self-piercing riveters or SPR. Intelligently designed you know, this is great because it provides you a complete standalone workstation. And whether you opt for the three drawer model as shown on this slide or the five drawer model, either way, it's a fully integrated, lockable, you can close the drawers, you can put the dust cover on. We're gonna try and eliminate any of that cross-contamination between steel particles and aluminum particles. You have the ability to adjust all your different power settings right there off the face of the welding unit. Hopefully you can see my screen if we end up exporting this video later, but our Denfix catalog has a really cool breakdown on page nine that shows what comes with the DF900B, with the DF900DX, and the DF900DXE. 
grab a catalog if you'd like one, send us an email, and we'd be happy to get one out into your hands. Um, but really, the 900B is our basic model or our starter model, if you will. It's the same 110 capacitated discharge welder. It comes with much less tools on a much smaller footprint. Okay, it'll save you cost. It works great as a satellite unit. So maybe you already have a DX or a DXE and you're looking for an additional unit, but you don't need all the tools uh, because you already have them. This is a great way to bring another standalone station into your shop uh, that just has a, a much smaller footprint. You get both types of alu studs, the leverage puller, the T-puller, two sizes of brushes. Does come with what you need, the basics to get started. Uh, I would almost recommend any shop to jump into the DX or the DXE models because it brings in your squeeze puller. You're also additionally going to get the bridge puller. This is coming on a much larger footprint. It has a three drawer lockable workstation. That uh, previous unit, the B, doesn't have the, the lockable feature. It does tend to be open, but there is a very nice dust cover that comes with it to keep that contamination separate. But this one has a lockable drawer that hood can come down and close to keep everything nice and locked away. Infrared temperature gauge is included. Uh, you also get that heat gun. This comes with a three piece hammer set. This has the dead blow hammer, uh, the nylon chisels. It does come with that 700 DX inline paint remover, uh, as well as the fiber disc for removing all your paint. When you get into our extended or DXE unit, we've upgraded to the five drawer lockable cabinet. Gives you a little bit additional more storage. You get the three piece hammer, aluminum hammer set, as well as the nylon dollies. Really nice set there too. So all the goodies, pretty much everything you're gonna need right there in one station. So before we start our repair, it's important that we set up and prep our panel. The removal of paint is done best with the 700DX. This is our eliminator tool. This is a uh, multi-function tool. You can use it for removing pinstripes, decals, uh, seam sealers, paint, depending on which wheel you put in it. Uh, the fiber discs are what we like to use for the removal of paint. Don't use your steel tool. You know, this is creating a lot of little steel particles all the way up in the housings of the tool. If you have this tool and you, you like it and love it for steel, get a separate one for aluminum, okay? Keep it dedicated to aluminum. You wanna remove all the paint. I mean, you wanna get nice shiny aluminum underneath. Remove any bit of oxidation, any bit of paint. Uh, after you've removed your paint with the eliminator tool, you removed all your oxidation with the wire brushes. And there's a technique to brushing. I recommend being very vigorous, vigorous and deliberate, precise and meaningful. Now we're gonna talk about how to set up the machine. Okay, it's a 110 volt plug-in. So it's a very common plug. It's not a 220. It doesn't need uh, that, that much volts of electricity to, to run. There is a power strip built onto your unit. Uh, whether you have the B, the DX, or the DXE, plug that right into the power strip there is a switch on the back, as well as a button in the front that turns it on and off. Okay, so make sure your switch in the back's on, push your button, turns it on. When you turn this on, it's going to start you at the power setting of five. That's generally going to be higher than what we recommend. We recommend starting at power level three. When you go down to three, you have the ability to push the toggle button which will then show you how many watts power level three is at. Power level three, push your button, it'll take you, it'll show the number 85, that's 85 watts. That's a great place to start. You can always go up from there. You have the ability to then go up or down by individual watts. So once you hit that toggle button from three and it shows you 85, you can go 86, 87, 88, and you can dial in very precise wattage without using the preset settings. You know, you can change the individual wattage uh, aside from moving through the preset settings. Okay, so turn to level three to start. That's gonna be a recommendation that we have. 
we've got our panel set up properly. We've got our machine set up properly. We're ready to do our first weld. And here are some tips and techniques for achieving a strong weld. It's gonna be important to choose the correct stud, which is something that my wife did about 10 years ago. But loading the stud into the gun is really important too. Okay, so if you have an alu magnesium stud or an alu silicone stud, once you take that, try not to touch the tip or touch the end of it. When you go to load it into your gun, grab it by the base, by the threaded part of the stud, and get it started. The next thing you want to do is maybe use your fingernail or maybe even the, the brush. Uh, you've got those brushes that you just got done doing all your brushing. Grab it by the end of it. Don't go right onto the tip because it does have that little, little nipple, if you will. Um, but push it from the edge all the way down until it just barely sits above the threshold of the gun. It's about one millimeter or maybe like one thumbnail length. You're going to want to make sure that you've got clean grounds on the gun. Now, both of those grounds are going to, uh, I'm going to jump one screen ahead real quick. You can see both grounds are going to be on the left and the right of your weld. You want to make sure that both of those grounds are touching bare aluminum, not on the painted side, not, not anywhere there's oxidation. Everywhere, all three of those prongs coming down, the two grounds and the one with your pin, are going to be touching clean aluminum. And then you're just going to push it down and be able to activate your weld. Make sure that you have good contact. Make sure that your pins are straight and perpendicular to the panel. If you have good contact, if you have clean grounds, uh, you would clean the grounds by using about 180 grit. Just take some of your 180 grit sandpaper, make sure to scuff up and rough up any contamination on your, uh, you know, copper colored grounds. That way they're nice and clean. You've got a clean surface and you go ahead and pop that pin in place. I believe this is Again, a- Again, uh, perpendicular video. to the material as it's uh, straight up and down. I'll do that again for you guys too. That was a uh, video of a class that we did just the other day. You got your gun loaded again, up. perpendicular to the material as it's uh, straight up and down. And so what you've got there just to, to show is you've, you've just installed your pin, your pull point. It's got an attachment to the panel where then you can put again, your eyelets or finger pullers onto that threaded pin. So you've got these pins now lined up, whether it's one or whether it's several, and you have these twist on eyelets that'll thread directly onto those pins. Those finger pullers are awesome. They're, they're really easy. It's really nice because they're really simple, able to slide onto those threads, lock in place, give you a very strong pull point attachment, and then be able to quick tab straight off. Uh, no, no threading needed. Get a couple extra for your toolbox. Um, those self-locking and, and quick release will save a lot of additional time. So you can adjust the height of these attachments as well, either by sliding it farther down your threads or twisting it farther down the threads so that your pull point is, is exactly where you want it. So if you want to set it a little bit lower or a little bit higher from where it's at, thread it down a little farther or back it up a little bit higher. And you could do that with either one of these tools, the eyelets or the finger puller. So um, this will give you the ability to, you know, slide them up or down uh, to gain a, a uniform height, especially if you're doing a bridge pull. We'll talk about using the bridge puller here in a minute. So this is adding our pull points, you know, and then accurately heating the panel prior to doing our pulls. It's going to be make the metal softer. It's going to make the metal, metal more workable. And so what you've got there is a photo of the heat gun we talked about and the ability to be very accurate on the temperature in which you're heating the panel. Hello, Peter Van with Denfix Equipment. Here demonstrating the DF900DXC alu spot aluminum repair station. We're gonna talk about getting your panel properly prepped so that you can get a good adhesion of the stud to pull dents out. Starting with turning on the machine, power switch on the back, power switch on the front. The machine will automatically turn on to five. Our recommendation is to turn that down to three. The machine's on. 
installing my rivet, I avoid touching the end of it, sliding it in and using the edge of my fingernail to push it down. And there's about a fingernail's width between the end of the receiver and the top of the rivet of the stud. Using the fiber wheel tool that is provided with the DF 900 DXE to remove the initial paint and coatings. And then using the large brush, cross brushing in two directions in at least two passes each side. And then using the small brush in two directions, again, cross brushing, but only in one direction when you do the actual brushing to bring all the oxidation to the side. It is critical to get all that oxidation off. Aluminum oxidizes immediately when it's exposed. So it is an, very important to put your set on immediately after you brush it and get all the oxidation off. Proper panel prep will ensure good adhesion of the stud. So we're looking at a stud that was burnt into an area that wasn't prepped properly. It had a big spark and a big flare up. You can see the burn flash on the edge and the burn around the edge of it, which shows that it was burning contaminants. And when we try to pull on it, it pops right off. Versus a properly one, I can pull on it, pull the panel up. You can see I'm actually overstretching it and it has a good bite on it. Prep your panels properly and you'll get a good pull. All right, let's get you guys back and go ahead and finish up here a few more important topics. So for pulling tools, once we got our stud put on, we've talked about how to do everything we get to the point where our stud's on. Now, what do we do? We got four pulling tools. These are gonna be, you got your eyelets and your finger pullers attached, you're ready to do your pulls. You've got a very delicate uh, hand puller. It's a T-bar style puller. It's very simple. You hook it underneath the edge of the eyelet and you use your arm and you, you give it a little bit of muscle. Okay, this is gonna be for your simple repairs, your single small dents, one individual pull point at a time to be able to lift that metal panel, that aluminum panel back into place. Okay, we also have a squeeze puller. Uh, this squeeze puller is gonna be the most common that people use. Uh, it is going to be about 80% of your pulls. And what this does is it allows for the pull of one attachment at a time with a squeeze motion. Those two pads are going to go ahead and hold the panel down while you squeeze your pull point attachment up uh, and be able to finesse that pull into the desired form. Uh, you have the ability to use that screw on the top, the, the adjustment, to be able to lock it in place as well. So you can adjust the height of your squeeze as well as lock it under pressure, which is nice for an extra set of hands. If you want to do any stress relief hammering, you can, you can continue to keep that pin under tension while you do your uh, repair. We also have a leverage puller. That's going to be the long black bar up in the top right. It looks very similar to that. Couldn't pull an image of it exactly, but you have a pad that you're gonna be using as your leverage point and a hook, and you're gonna be able to hook your pull point and go ahead and pull using leverage. Uh, you gotta be careful with this. Uh, you use this for your bigger pulls where you need a little bit more muscle, but it's important to position that pad somewhere safe. You don't wanna create more damage into that pad uh, that the, from the pad side uh, just because you, you use too much muscle there. So if you can, uh, be conscious of that, slide it into the right direction, and just recognize where you're going uh, with the leverage puller. And then last but not least, there is a bridge puller. When you have a crease or a long set of damage and you want to line up multiple attach points at once, you can use the bar to go through all of the rings of your attachment points and be able to lift up on that bar with a uniform pull. This is for the removal of creases. Uh, you use this with a row of studs at once, slide the bar in, and you now, with our tool, you have the ability to massage it. It also has that self-locking feature, allowing for an extra set of hands if you wanna do stress relief and hammering 
uh, around your repair to help form your metal into the desired shape. Four tools for pulling. This is a look at what the bridge puller looks like. Um, you have your pads set down to hold the panel down. You have a uh, leverage bar that you use to create a tension type motion upward, and you're pulling at multiple attachment points at once. There's many techniques and methods to pulling. I'm not here to talk about that today. Your application of heat is a whole technique. Uh, document it because it may change from vehicle to vehicle. Your hammering and your stress relief around the repair is technique. Practice. Working the panel, working the dent uh, takes time. Uh, when you do your squeeze pull, are you doing a steady pressure with that squeeze or are you kind of bouncing it into place? That's another technique. I think it's important to talk about the removal of those pins. Once we've removed our eyelets and removed our finger pullers, I would recommend cutting them with cutters is gonna be the first best way to remove those studs, okay? When you remove them with cutters, there's a body file that's attached uh, that comes with the tool. This is gonna be a much better option than using a grinder. A grinder is gonna take that metal too fast, too hot, too quick. Removing it with our cutters, and then using the body file to shave down any remaining residue before you move forward with your refinishing of the panel. Uh, try not to create that tree trunk damage when you do uh, pulling them to one side or the other like you might do with a steel pin. But uh, using cutters and using your body file is what's recommended. So, hey guys, this is the opportunity. This is the type of shop that we can go into with this sort of a presentation. This is the type of shop we can go into with this sort of equipment. I, I'm gonna go ahead and hold off on my SPR presentation on self-piercing riveters. I'm gonna stop the share. I'm gonna bring it back and open it up for Q&A, open it up for the rest of the discussion. We'll do SPR at a different time. Mark, if you have any feedback, um, love to hear it too. I know this was kind of a rep presentation, but- uh, I do. I, I, I mean, it, it gave me some pointers of what I, I can do a little bit more, maybe a little more cleanup. I, I mean, I. I, do, I did go out and buy my own stainless steel wire brushes and stuff to make sure that everything's clean. Um, the only, our, our, our machine's a little bit older than that one. So, I mean, you're going threes and five, uh, three and five. I'm, I'm looking at a dial that says, I, I'm assuming it's gonna be pretty much the same thing, like 85, because ours starts off at 85. Is that your unit? Yeah, yeah that's ours. Okay, I've never seen this one in particular. Um, you can tell that uh, it's, it doesn't, uh, it's not our current offering. Correct. It is this very similar application. Um, exactly. I'm gonna take these pictures over to Dead Fix next week where I'm gonna have the uh, Toyota Prius panel prepped out, ready to go in front of me with a nice welder behind me to, to go over a little bit more training for another shop. If you want me to ask any specific questions about your machine and how the power settings work there, um, I would like to do that. Let me take down your phone number. I know you have my email address. Do you just want to send me a quick email with your contact info? Uh, yeah, or you could just do uh, thrasherx gmail.com. That's one of the most hardcore email addresses I've ever heard. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Mark. Yeah. I got a question for you. Did you take, uh, did, was this helpful at all or bring to light why your pins aren't sticking? Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple things that, I mean, since I'm in a shop, I'm, I'm trying to do things. I'm a flat rater, so everything's, I have to be quick about it. So I think my, my prep has been not that good. Just so, curious. Um, and I've also, I've been trying to, uh, I was doing everything cold. So I basically just take, I clean the, clean the panel and then put the, weld the, weld the nail on and it, it would just pull off. So I'm assuming that, so I decided to start YouTubing and trying to figure it out because we've been having a lot more of these vehicles come in and nobody else at the shop wants to do this aluminum repair. <laughs> so I'm like, sure. So just been trying to, do more of it and and uh i mean i really want to use this machine i've been trying to figure out i've been watching a couple other guys using other machines and it seems like they're doing less prep and they're just uh it's like their their nails are hitting and they're they're pulling and making money and i'm sitting there i'm like 
I go through, I don't know, 15 nails, and then I get one to finally grab. So, and then I work with that. My, my discussions with uh, techs that are using our unit and other units, the identifying the aluminum seems to be a challenge. Uh, some of these guys who have units don't even realize there's different kinds of aluminums and blends. And I'm noticing that from technicians. That's kind of been a challenge also, and along with the cleaning, like you said, the prep. And the other thing is that they, they sent two, two packages and I felt the, sil the silicone was, was actually holding better than magnesium, but now to come to find out that the magnesium is the ones that I'm supposed to be using for the, like the Fords and the GMs. So I, I didn't really, when we first got the machine, didn't really pay too much attention to it on, on what, the, what the guy was explaining. And now I'm like, kind of wish I did. <laughs> better so, late than never. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Thanks for the input, Mark. Hey, no problem. I um I thank you for coming out. I mean, I, I would assume that you know the the clean ground, the correct pin, um, the clean non oxidized panel is probably going to set up the best sort of success. I think those are three really important aspects. Uh, a lot of that was, as you can tell, Mark, we, we started uh, with Dent Fix. We're a sales agency for, uh, for the West Coast. And we started with Dent Fix earlier this year, uh, 2020, right before, right before this all went down. And so a lot of our experience comes from watching those YouTube videos, talking to people, uh, reading and learning from, from a work from home perspective. Uh, very little hands on at this Point. And I think that as our, our team and our agency uh, steps into more of the hands-on, maybe even more vehicle-specific uh, information, uh, that's just going to come with some extra experience. So yeah. um, we, we look forward to sending a, a, myself or Shane Bull, who come out of SoCal, uh, up the Central Coast. We're going to try and get out to you. If you come across a uh, aluminum panel, if you got like a door or a hood, hold on to it. Let's uh, okay. let, let's let's practice and play around with that. I'll send you contact info, and I'll make sure to give you a, you know a good week's notice. I'm looking about uh, probably like two weeks out right now. Okay. Now on the gun, is there any more prep that I need to? Because I've been on the the left and right. I've been trying to uh, keep those nice and clean because I know they they do tend to get a little um, uh, not really dirt, but it's just like a well, I guess it would be dirt. So I, I usually take a like a, like a red Scotch Brite and make sure those are nice, nice and clean, and then I do do the tip also before I put the nail the, the, the nail in. I mean, that, that's probably is that pretty good then? Yeah, obviously you want clean ground points. That way you got no sure. contamination in between uh, your charge of electricity there. Um, the handling of the pin also, like I said, we don't want to get our our finger uh oils and contamination from that on the head of the welded surface so well, i've been using rubber gloves too so okay um but being able to just manage the side of it and be able to push it down either with our, our thumbnail and just kind of press into place or um uh, the edge of something you know and you just kind of push it down yeah. so on the what's the why would you need a fingernails gap in between the the gun and the nail I just think I that's what it sets. I just think that that's all the way down. I don't think it's going to okay. set flush just because of that's the depth set of the pin, and that okay. could be the current model. Like I said, I, I've the current model and the gun seem to be sure. maybe a little different. But I was always told that you know when you go to push it down, there's just going to be a small slight gap that's loaded. Don't try and push mm -hmm. it any farther. Don't try and you know jam it in any more because you do want to have it, you know, release the electricity but also be able to pull out uh, when you're done, so. Uh, cool, all right, okay. All righty. I, well, I, I on. really appreciate this. I'm gonna send you an invite too, if you'd like to, uh, you know, spend some time once I'm actually at the office where I can have that panel in front of me, I can do another broadcast here where maybe you had a chance to play around with it over the weekend or the next couple of days, um, see if you had any more success and we'll just go ahead and follow up with you from there. 
Um, well, I just got done with the door two weeks ago, so and it came out pretty decent. I mean, I, now I got to figure out how to unstretch aluminum, which is almost <laughs> impossible. Yeah, I like that unstretched term because that's what I used in my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> it's easy to stretch, but it's difficult to unstretch. It's uh, exactly shrinking. It. Yeah, it's it's very difficult to shrink aluminum. So, and then, yeah. there's, there's so many techniques, the hammer on, the hammer off, you know, what type of hammer you're using is it an aluminum hammer or a steel hammer. They're going to have different, you know, uh, energies when you, when you release kinetic. the, the kinetic energy. I mean, those, uh, those dollies, there's a whole technique with dolly on dolly off. Um, I will show you real quick since you, you have my video here, what the dolly set looks like. It's a pretty cool set. Uh, if I can tip it down a little bit, maybe even tip it up. It all comes nice and prepared. You get all the different, you know, sizes and shapes. They all have a home. You get the shoehorn one. You get the uh, a lot of different shapes. Our kid, our kid has most of those. It's just they have the steel dollies and the steel hammers. There's three and three and three. What's nice is these are nice and lightweight. They're they're nylon, so you're not going to get yeah. that steel energy that you would need for kind of knocking steel around. Um, <clears throat> It gives you a, a different energy set. I mean, this box right here is super, super lightweight. This is the aluminum hammer set, and it's it's one of the additional add-ons. And what's nice about these hammers is that the uh, energy that's created with this is much different than your normal stroke of a uh, steel hammer. And this is going to be the aluminum one. This is the aluminum hammer set. Yeah. And so these are nice. Uh, I like keeping them very, you know, protected in their bags. But sure. this will give you a, a full-blown set here. Uh, with a much different throw than you're used to. This allows for a lot more delicacy, uh, different uh, shapes and heads. And um, we'll, uh, we'll send you out a catalog. I'll send you an email if you want to get me your address. Uh, we can get that into your hands before we make it out. I love making my okay. super post run. I normally stay the night in a hotel. We haven't quite been cleared for some of that yet. Um, sure. It's a weird year, so we're trying to do what we can. This is a whole new skill set, doing this over Zoom. Exactly. It's my first time on Zoom, so. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter had to help me with trying to get this, on, get, get this going. <laughs> well, this, this is my first time being my own administrator for Zoom. Normally, we have somebody else, a uh, very handsome, redheaded man who comes in. <laughs> Uh, allow us the ability to uh, to kind of be a moderator administrator. Okay. Well, you're doing a great job. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Team Aluminum in the house right here. <laughs> in the house. <laughs> thank you for watching.